Hello and welcome to my presentation on DuckBench, our benchmarking library for dynamic algorithm configuration. My name is Theresa Eimer and this was joint work with my co-authors André Wietenkap, Maximilian Reimer, Steven Andriansen, Frank Kutter and Marius Lindauer. In dynamic algorithm configuration, we aim to adapt a target algorithm's hyperparameters on the fly using hyperparameter policy. This policy gets as input the al target algorithm's current state and chooses a hyperparameter value for the next step. The target algorithm then executes that step on its current instance and returns feedback in the form of a reward as well as its updated internal state. So this is what a duck benchmark looks like and if we zoom out we see how it interacts with a duck solver. So the duck solver is supplied with a configuration space as well as the instance space just as we know from per instance algorithm configuration but then at each step it updates the policy and in turn get the information of the previous and current updated internal state, the reward as well as the hyperparameter that was chosen. So in principle, we have seen great results with DUCK on different domains like AI planning or evolutionary computation, but benchmarking DUCK has been hard so far. And the main reason for that is that most target algorithms need some sort of adaption to be compatible to be used for DUCK. And this adaptions on the code level often have to be done in conjunction with a domain expert. So we need a combination of domain expertise and DUCK expertise in the same place. That is, of course, seldom. Additionally, as the domains can be quite different, the interfaces that result and have resulted in previous benchmarks are often specialized and not compatible with each other. So we end up with a situation where we have different methods for DUCK, but it's very hard to compare them across benchmarks and it's also not trivial to reproduce existing experiments. That, of course, can hold the field back quite a bit, and this is why we propose DuckBench. And DuckBench has two main functions. The first is to serve as a benchmark template for domain experts to hopefully make it easier and incentivize them to create new benchmarks. And the second is to provide a simple and unified framework, an interface for DAC solvers that uh, can be used universally so that we can actually benchmark algorithms across different problems. The interface itself is based on OpenAI's Jim interface, so a reinforcement learning interface, but it should be simple enough and adapted to the domain of algorithm configuration that it is easy to use both for reinforcement learning but also non-reinforcement learning algorithms. For example, we could easily imagine evolutionary algorithms being used on this interface without much adaption on that side required. But of course, the most interesting part are the benchmarks themselves. We chose six initial benchmarks for DuckBench. That includes two toy benchmarks, a benchmark from AI planning, two from evolutionary computation, and one from the domain of deep learning. Most benchmarks are single hyperparameter benchmarks for now, so we really only adapt one hyperparameter in each step. And to illustrate how the um, optimal or maybe baseline policies compare to static policies and random dynamic policies on those benchmarks, we evaluated them over different seeds. Let's go through them one by one, starting with our toy benchmarks. Our toy benchmarks are called Sigmund and Luby, and as the name suggests, the task is to approximate a sigmoid function or the Luby sequence in each of them. They are very cheap to evaluate because there's no real target algorithm running in background, but as they are very flexible, they can be scaled easily in difficulty. So this is a good option for duck prototyping because we can create very specific scenarios in the instance space, we can go very high up in difficulty, but we stay computationally very, very cheap. And as we can see, they have a bit of a different profile too. So uh, if we look at these box plots, we have the uh, evaluations on across our instance sets. And on the left, in both cases, we have the optimal policy that we can compute in these cases. Next to them, a dynamic random policy, where at each step we chose a random value out of the configuration of the search space. And then for sigmoid, we have the three best static policies next to the three worst static policies. And uh, Luby only has five different uh, six different policies, sorry. So uh, Luby, we really see all of them. Um, and as we can see in sigmoid, we have a very broad distribution of performances and uh, the dynamic random policy performs somewhere in between the best and worst ones. And we can also see that depending on the instance, we really need a different policy as uh, the best performing static policies actually don't perform as well on some of the instances as the worst ones, even though the worst ones, of course, in the mean are 
have a much lower performance. On Luby, the picture is a bit different. We have one static policy that is much better than the rest. That's, of course, the first element of the Luby sequence, because we always want to start with that. But the rest is, along with the dynamic random policy, quite bad compared to the optimal policy. The distance there in the mean is much larger. So this is actually a harder benchmark and requires less generalization, and more uh, just simply is more difficult in the base case. As for the real world benchmarks, the first one is fast downward. Fast downward is based on the fast downward planner, where we select the search heuristic for each search step. In the instance space, we here can choose a planning domain and the instances of the domain that we want to use. And for the single instance case, previous work has actually shown that that can outperform static heuristic selection by quite a bit. Uh, the same work has also shown that in toy domains, which we also include, DAC is actually optimal. And we can clearly see how that's possible. Uh, this is actually the toy domain with a negative cumulative reward, so lower is better here. And uh, the optimal and the dynamic random policies are quite close together. They are actually surprisingly close together, given that the static policies, those are both of them that are possible in the toy setting, perform quite badly on some instances, even though they do very well on others. So here, first downward is the prime example of a benchmark where we really want to use duck. Now for the first of our two CMA benchmarks. This is learning step size adaption in CMA, yes, on given black box functions with a starting point. So in this case, we use COCO functions. In CMA, yes, for learning step size adaption, there's actually a precedent or a few different precedents actually in handcrafted heuristics that adapt the step size over time. Those have actually also been used in the case of CSA to guide the reinforcement learning process to outperform some of these heuristics. Here we can see CSA on the left, then the random dynamic policy, and then again the three best and worst static policies. And again we can see that dynamic random policy does not actually perform very well here. It's still better somewhat than the worst dynamic policies, but it is not very good. And even CSA, in this case, in this selection of functions, does not perform as well as the best static policies. So there is quite some work to be done for DAC on this benchmark specifically. The same goes actually for our second CMAES benchmark, which is MODEA. Here we don't only choose a learning rate, so one hyperparameter, we actually choose the algorithm components of CMAES, again on black box functions. That means we have 11 different components, for each of which we can turn them on or off, or have a few choices, so that adds up to over 4,000 different combinations of CMAES. Previous work has again shown that dynamic configuration here can be beneficial, although it was in a more limited capacity and not adaption at every step, because of course this is a very hard problem with a search space this large and complicated. And indeed we can see here that the dynamic random policy performs quite a bit worse compared to how it performed on uh, CMAES in the step size adaption, where it was somewhere in the middle between the best and worst static policies, and here it is clearly towards the upper end of that. Here we also don't really have a dynamic baseline so far, so this is really an open and unsolved problem at this point. Our last benchmark is the S2DDL benchmark, that's stochastic gradient descent in deep learning. And as the name suggests, we adapt the learning rate of a small neural network in a classification task. The network structure and the training seed can be adapted, so we really learn across a set of architectures here. In deep learning, again, we have seen that non-adaptive hyperparameter schedules and learning rates, so that means learning rate schedules that are conditioned only on time, have been quite successful, for example, in cosine annealing. But we have also seen that we can learn the learning rate. Uh, an example is the Chris Daniel, but there's also been some extensions of this work. Interestingly enough, though, this is a bit of a special case of a benchmark. As you can see here, if we look at the dynamic random policy on the very left, it performs considerably worse in the worst case than uh, all other static policies. And that's something we haven't seen so far. So actually, it doesn't seem to be very easy to dynamically configure all the instances of the SGD DL benchmark. This is more of a generalization challenge here. But of course, these plots isolated don't tell us how the benchmarks compare. So we also try to visualize different dimensions in which making which benchmarks make DAC difficult. For example, the action and state space size. Of course, a benchmark with a large action space 
So a lot of different configuration possibilities is harder to solve. And that's, for example, the case for CMAES or Modia, where we have a lot of options. Same goes for the state space. And of course, the noise level is a very similar criterion if we have a lot of noise, again, as in the CMAES benchmarks, and also to a lesser point and fast downward, it will be harder than for an, a benchmark like Sigmoid or Luby or even SGD, where we have very limited noise. Reward quality is interesting, actually, because this is often domain specific. In fast downward, for example, we have very a poor reward quality, which makes the difficulty here higher and the slider further out, because we only get a penalty for taking a step. So it's a reward of minus one in each episode, and uh, then a combined negative reward at the end. Whereas, for example, in the CMA benchmarks, we get a very informative reward, namely the fitness of the best individual after each iteration. So we get a very direct feedback what the hyperparameter that we just adapted did. So that's, of course, nice in this case, but not feasible everywhere. Then we also have two categories, which uh, are very interesting for uh, proceeding in DAC. One of them is policy heterogeneity. And as we've seen before, within our benchmarks, there's large discrepancies in some benchmarks between instances. And uh, again, very hard here is CMAS and MODEA, of course, because the black box functions we use are very diverse and we really have to achieve generalization over them. The last category is dynamicity, which describes how often we expect the hyperparameters to change in the best case. And here, first downward ranks chiefly, which we have also seen somewhat in the box plots, right? Because the dynamic random policy performed very close to the optimal one already. So we assume that we really need a lot of change in these policies to be optimal for fast downward, and less or so in other uh, problems, like for example, Luby, where we have a very low dynamicity, or even SGD. All in all, however, if you compare all the uh, benchmarks we have, you see that we have a lot of options in uh, different difficulty ranges for all of our attributes. So even though we only have six benchmarks and two of them are toy benchmarks, we really can cover a lot of ground to show the strengths of weak and weaknesses of different DAC solving algorithms. Of course, however, we don't want to stop there. There's still a lot of work to be done when it comes to DuckBench. One important point is that we connect better to established tools and standards in the target domains. We've been trying this since the release of DuckBench by, for example, integrating IOH Profiler into our CMAES benchmarks. A related point is that we want to get closer to established algorithm configuration tools in the way our search space is defined, for example. That includes using structured action spaces, structured search spaces, but also extending the possible search spaces to multiple hyperparameters for each benchmark. Something that we really want to do also for better accessibility to the field of DAC is to provide a better coverage of toy benchmarks. Because right now, even though we have Sigmund and Lumi, they don't cover the full spectrum of difficulty dimensions and we really want to enable people to prototype the algorithms on cheap benchmarks before they have to go to the oftentimes very expensive target domains. Last but not least, we have several ongoing co collaborations with domain experts to provide new benchmarks and also extend the current ones to really bring DAC forward as a field. If you're curious now, please come check DuckBench out on GitHub, and also I'm looking forward to seeing all of you at the poster session.